Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Empires, Season 3, Episode 5. This will be our last pre-recorded, and I've got a bit of material to cover in this particular episode. We're going to go from everything we built on the modules and roadbed and everything up to this point, up through uh, the very basic landforms, all the way up to some ground cover that we can build on top of. So, here I'm slapping a little paint down um, with the... Florist foam that I'm working with, you don't want to soak it in paint, or you don't want a thick layer of latex paint, that is. Um, you can't airbrush the stuff, and I've done that. That puts a thinner layer. Or you could do the, you know, latex paint. But you probably want to spray some water. Uh, I keep spraying it. I've got everything wet here anyway. Uh, one little thing of note, too, that you'll see is uh, a little bit of paper tape or, or masking tape. Um... I've got a couple spots that I've been playing with the uh, expanding foam, but I've had really good luck using uh, masking tape as basically a pseudo form to to force the expanding foam into the shape that I want it so that it doesn't get out of control or it doesn't all run down the front of the mountain facade. Uh, I mean, you can see that it's leaked a little bit in one spot. and The point is just to get some color on it quickly. And I'm a big fan of very quickly getting color onto my ground for, uh, ground forms or land forms so that I can see what it's going to look like, what to expect from it, see if I want to make adjustments. And I like to look at this as early in the process as I possibly can so that I can make adjustments as quickly in the process as I possibly can. It's part of the, one of the biggest reasons that I use foam of any type to work with versus plaster. Part of the reason I'm not a particularly big fan of plaster in most cases, um, it has use cases, but in most cases is, is because I find its modification process to be fairly messy uh, and not very forgiving. Uh, and I'm much less reluctant to make changes, especially if they're kind of minor changes. Uh, with the foam, I could put paint on it, I could put dirt and ground forms on it. I, a lot of times, even after static grass is on it, I'll go back with a saw and make some minor changes and cut into it and make adjustments. And I'm not afraid to. And you can see this is some florist foam and some pink foam. There's some pink foam uh, holding up the land forms. I, I try to, to not use... The florist foam is expensive, so you want to to use it where forestation will be heavy, uh, places where you're going to plant a, a lot of uh, forestation, and um, and not use it so much in other places. So now this is um, a matte medium. Actually, that's Mod Podge, but Mod Podge is a, an artist medium as well. It's basically the same thing. It's just a, a medium consistency as opposed to a thinner consistency. I, I use both matte. Matte Medium is really good. Mod Podge is very available. I could just get it at the local store. I could just get it at Walmart. Um, whereas uh, Matte Mediums, you know, I've got to order it when I run out of it. I've got some right now, and I ordered a, a bundle of Artist Mediums recently. Um, per another gentleman's YouTube channel that, that I've become a fan of. A lot of people on YouTube who have been keeping up with him have become a fan of uh, Boomer Dioramas. I'd really recommend his channel to anybody. Um who keeps up with this stuff. He's one of the channels that I think is a must watch on YouTube. You'll see that I've, I'm experimenting with some of his explained techniques um, here in the next little bit. But I went and ordered some of the uh, modeling pastes that he's working with. I want to experiment with them. I've been making my own pastes with uh, the ground goop that I make. Uh, I make that in a bunch of different forms with um, cellulose uh, insulation, the uh, non treated kind. You don't want the the kind that has uh, animal retardants or fire retardants in it. You just want the just the same less insulation. I make it with the clay or paper mache products sometimes, or I make my own from uh, various paper products. Uh, typically, toilet paper that's that's that I get wet and tear up with a, a wire wheel. So I've made my own artist mediums uh, quite a bit. I, I mix vermiculite in sometimes. I've mixed sand in sometimes, but I'm going to, I've ordered some of the, and have a bunch of the golden uh, setting materials per uh, Boomer Diorama's recommendation for those products, and I'm really excited to try those out.
And I kind of work in a couple different spots at different times here. I'm slapping a little ground goop in. I apparently, apparently could not find my little plastic stick. Or my favorite uh, tool for working with this stuff. That didn't work very well, obviously. But uh, the paper, or the the wood stick is not working very good. The the, the shim. Uh, I keep a bunch of uh, shims like you'd use to set a door with. Um, I use them to mix paint because I run out of paint stirs all the time. I, I use them for a bunch of different reasons. They're handy to just pick up and grab as a scrap piece of wood to work with, but I think I got tired of using that here a minute ago. Uh, my favorite uh, shaping tool is uh, Artist's Palette Brushes or Palette Knives. I've got a bunch of different ones of those that I really like working with. I just guess I don't think I had one up here at the at my workshop at the moment. And the good thing about ground goop is you could use it to fill in gaps, you could use it to shape, you could use it to fill in larger holes. It's it's a very flexible medium. And I've given up with to use my fingers. And that, that works really well for certain applications, especially if you get the ground goop slightly wet or get your fingers wet, as I've been doing here. Um, it lets you really shape the material. And you see the cat that ran by a second ago? I had some cats invade my workshop recently, and they scare the crap out of me at random times. I cannot seem to get rid of them. As we progress through this video, and like I said, there's quite a bit of material to cover in this one. I've been shooting all month video here, and you'll see some some considerable changes uh, to my progress here in a, a few minutes when we get there. Some of that related to the workshop, but. And I've went back and made changes to this even after I got this done. I've now went back and, and cut into the hillside and put a road up through there because I'm continually looking at the prototype photos and uh, Google Earth to see how kind of the the profiles and the roads and how things enter and how I could possibly compress those into something that is achievable in the amount of modeling space that I have. So I've already made changes quite a bit to this little hillside right here. But, but I want to get it covered up. I want to get color on it, uh, dirt on it pretty quickly, and then, you know, then I'm not at all afraid to make changes. I, none of none of it's precious to me. That's one of the, the biggest things I think that works really well in my favor is that none of it's precious. Uh, I'm not afraid to tear anything out. Uh, normally, the things that I'm the happiest with in my modeling are the things I've done at least two or three times. Now, this is the techniques that I, that I really, or at least... The overarching philosophy that I've taken from Boomer Dioramas that I'm really trying to apply here. So typically I've had a number of dirt and grout, um, just a bunch of different mixtures of, of, of contours and textures. And in textures of, of different uh, densities and different grades and different colors, and that I'm trying to get the color right um, at the time of application. And that's a really difficult process considering that glue changes the color of a lot of scenic mediums, a lot of scenic materials. It darkens a lot of them. Uh, grout doesn't tend to be as subjective to that as dirt is, for example. But what I'm starting to experiment with doing, and I'm very happy with the results I've been finding already, is putting down a medium that I like the texture of and airbrushing it. And getting all my color there. And it, and this has worked so well over the past month of me experimenting with it and shooting it in video that I think I'm committed to basically using um, whatever gives me the right grade or consistency and probably in a, a white or a light color allows me to, to see contours and shapes and, and flaws and errors more easily and then airbrushing everything. So, to be a paints... And airbrushing and whatever I'm watching on YouTube and in that Nalgene bottle is 99 percent alcohol, 99 alcohol. Uh, sadly in the states for some reason at least where I am geographically 99 percent alcohol seems to be a little bit difficult to get a hold of so I've been ordering a uh, I've ordered a gallon of it 
uh, laboratory grade stuff. Not that it needs to be that, um, but I wanted a gallon of it. I wanted it in quantity. I like to buy most things in quantity. I buy the the glues that I use for plastic solvents, the methyl ethyl ketone and um, uh, methylated chlorine. Uh, I buy those in gallons. Uh, I buy you know paint thinner or or uh, mineral spirits. I buy that by the gallon. I, I, everything that I can buy, I buy the larger quantities, not because. Uh, not because I'm really trying to get a significant uh, economic discount, but just because I just don't want to chase the products. I just, when I have time to model, I want the mediums to work with the model. The the thing that I have the the sh- the biggest deficit of is is time. But I'm airbrushing a number of colors, building up some layers. This area along the right of way uh, here I made fairly wide. On the prototype, there's a little bit of an access road there, but it doesn't look like an access road. It's just a fairly wide, flat area that is pretty dark. And I'm having to practice and and refine my airbrushing techniques. I I haven't been at airbrushing or painting very long. But I haven't been afraid to experiment with it or try. I've been... I've airbrushed some freight cars. I've been putting a clear coat on with an airbrush. I've been fading with an airbrush per Ralph uh, Renzetti, the Mudfather, per his uh, help and instructions um, via our nightly chats and via his really excellent weathering series on uh, Model Running Live. And I, th- I think the airbrush has become one of my favorite tools. And as I've said many times before, I'm really an engineer and I'm very much not an artist. So. Uh, airbrush and, and that kind of techniques are not really that natural to me, but I really enjoy working with an airbrush. It's a really fun tool. I keep adding some alcohol at times as I work with getting the right consistency, messing with the colors to get the right colors. I'm not a natural at, at any of this, so I've had to, you know, mix grays and browns and stuff together. Some things that have worked real well is to, I, I have not had good luck using strong blacks. I think this is a, it's, it's not a black. It's a very dark color, but it's not a black. But I'm very gentle with really dark colors with blacks. And and I pretty much have decided never to use a straight black, at least not in scenery work. And this is one of my little cheaper airbrushes. I've got several at this point. Um, this little, I don't know, fifty dollar airbrush or something works really great for scenery products. I'm not a scenery work. I'm, I'm not at all afraid to use it or, or to mess it up. It wasn't an expensive purchase, so. And as I'm adding up, building up layers, building up layers, it's really starting to to come into something I like. And, you know, maybe I don't love the gray on top of the brown or the this color on top of that color. I just keep adding layers and it slowly gets closer and closer and closer to what I want. And back to adding uh, dirt contours, dirt textures. And you can see I had some fairly dark earth scenic uh, material already on a little bit of the landform that I've been playing with there. And after I've had such good luck with uh, we're just using, in this case, white grout or gray grout, um, I've had such good luck with it, with the airbrushing technique that I'm, I think I'm just going to standardize around using this one medium but getting my colors with, with paint. And all these sharper uh, hillside profiles, all these sharp, uh, this of uh, this waterway, obviously a waterway. Um, this little creek, um, you definitely got to kind of press the the ground into it to to get it to bite into that glue. And it sometimes takes a couple coats to get it to cover too. Now with using dirt and uh, scenery colors in the initial application, that was always a positive. It allowed me to to add different color varieties to it but if i if i'm gonna gonna stick with using uh white or gray or whatever some base color grout and then get all of my color in the painting process or airbrushing process after i really wanted to cover a little better so i 
uh, this little spoon, I, I've had this a long time. When I, I worked at a, a soil and water lab years ago, I've had that since since I was there, and it's the perfect little tool for for seeding application. And I cleaned all the the stuff that didn't stick down of this grout product, cleaned it all off, and sprayed it all off, and it's still dust is still blown away from it. So it, it is a somewhat dusty medium. Uh, and what I'm using in this area, because I want a fairly fine contour, is uh, unsanded grout, so it's really quite fine. But what I'm looking for there is, is dirt, so really not much gravel. I make, I'll make come back and put some gravel contours over when I figure exactly how I want the water to look before I uh, raise it or whatever I end up doing here. Now I've swapped modules, and you'll see some changes uh, here in a minute too, because um, I, I've now taken the modules home. You'll see those before long again in place, but um, I'm going to be working back and forth a little bit this month on two modules because I have them at various levels of completion. You can see I'm starting the track work in the back. I know this seems kind of counter to a lot of people's thought process, but I lay track pretty late in the process. And part of the reason that I do that is I really want to be quite sure that I like where I'm going um, that I like where I'm going with everything before I commit to track work. My track work is is time consuming. So I really want the scenery to be pretty doggone close because if I need to make it, and I want the look, overall look, the, the track plan, the track alignment, how it all fits in, the the scenery, the tree placement. I want the, uh, there's already a road installed at the back, you can see there. I want all of that to, to work pretty well together. And if I need to make changes, I want to figure that out before I start putting track work down because my track work is incredibly time consuming to install so now this module I'll be using kind of a mix of a couple different track laying techniques but the most foreground track will be by head laid track with the individual tie plates and that track has uh, 502 parts uh, I think it's 502 parts uh, for a three foot section so uh, I think it's worth it but and I'm really loving the results with airbrushing this this texture so put you know this grout texture on and airbrush it and I could get very good dirt looking effects and I've slowly come to this realization anyway through my own mechanisms um, because I've come to really like a dry brushing uh, technique and I started out with ballast where I, I put my ballast down I make my own ballast I put my ballast down uh, I use a dark wash on it to kind of soak in uh, I'm basically painting in the shadows that are cast by the particulate gradules of, of the ballast. And then I come back and dry brush over the over top of it. And you can see my airbrush technique is not spectacular as I've dropped dropped a little paint everywhere. So I haven't used an airbrush that long. So There's some muscle memory that I'm sure I'll develop as time goes on. But, but you don't have to be an expert or or really that comfortable with it to use it. I'm not that far along and I'm, I'm getting good results. And I can always, I will come back as I make this little gravel road through here. I'll come back and put the, the gray color over top of that for the for the pathway for the uh, car tracks or the wheel tread tracks uh, along. They'll go right over top of the little spot where I dropped a little pipe. No big deal. And most of this is static grass anyway. Static grass or grass mats. I may use some grass mats here. And I did cut through the, the road bed recently just to put that uh, culvert in. Um, that culvert is, uh, what is the name of the company? They're, they're sold through uh, uh, Iowa Scale Engineering, same company, guys that sell the Proto Throttle. They also sell some plastic products. Uh, I hate the shakiness here. I guess I hit the camera a few times. I had it hanging from one of those Gorilla Pods, hanging from the front fascia. But just a, another a second color, starting to get some, some variety of the contours here. Oh yeah, this is where I put that, must have these out of order slightly, but this is where I put that um, that culvert in and filled it back in. And here's a, a beautiful thing about some of the mediums. So working with paper mache, this is just paper mache and water. Um, that's just a, a paper particulate 
uh, that has, uh, if you pre-buy the paper mache uh, product, it's a paper particulate with a, a dry polymer adhesive mixed in. Uh, add a little water, and it's basically the same thing as the Hobosote ballast I've used, or the Hobosote road bed I'm using. Hobosote is just compressed paper, so compressed recycled paper. So I just got that shape right. Come in and fix some of the areas where I kind of dug into that with some actual ground goop, which is the same paper mache product. I just added some paint to it. The, adding the latex paint to it gives it color, of course, but it also adds a latex property to it. I don't generally like that on my roadbed where track lays across it. So, I mean, if I'm shaping along the right of way, I, it doesn't matter. I'll use paper mache if I'm just doing that. If I'm doing something with ground goop, I, I'll use that for uh, road uh, for the for the sides for the the ballast profiles and stuff. But if the track's going to lay across it, I really prefer that to be. Hobosote or just paper mache product. As you can take a little bit of the paint, smear it over top of it to change the color, get the color, get a little color profile there. Also, paper mache, just like Hobosote, does uh, benefit from paint, uh, from sealing the, the edge of it. So. And this is a little road on the other side of the module, um, and I kind of building up some contours to make it look like the road has a has that center berm that's kind of worn out over time. I slightly exaggerated this effect uh, initially, but I've kind of come back and kind of rubbed some. But some effects don't scale properly. So if you have a, a depressed road profile that's depressed two or three inches, where car tracks run over it. Um, you, you'd see that in the real world, but you're never going to see the millimeter of depression that would, that, or less than a millimeter of depression that would be there at HO scale. Uh, remember, um, a foot is 3.5 millimeters at HO scale, so if you're trying to model a two-inch depression or something, you're modeling sub one millimeter, that's, you're about one millimeter. That's not going to, that's not going to show very well. So there's a few things that have to be slightly exaggerated, slightly, in order to get them visible, to make them visible. Uh, part of this has to do with just physics, uh, light and gravity and effects such as that just work different as you scale them down. It's part of the reason that some weathering effects don't work exactly the same as Ralph would tell you. Um, it's true while well, weight doesn't work does it work exactly the same. I mean, you wouldn't take a a uh, hundred ton coal hopper and scale that down by one eighty seven and have you know a ton and a little bit you know one point two ton freight car. You'd never move it. So. Uh, these things scale, there's some proportionality there too. It's not a direct 1 to 87 scale proportion anyway because you have to kind of cube those things. But so there's some complex, there's some math involved in that. But just everything doesn't scale down properly. And it just needs to, it needs to look right to the eye when it comes to the scenic and some of these effects. And there's other effects that, that the prototype really matters on. So I really care a lot about the prototype when it comes to track alignment and the details because I'm going to operate prototypically. And, in my case, I know that my operations will work because they worked for the Norfolk and Western and later Norfolk Southern. I know they're going to work for me. I didn't invent my track alignment or track work scheme. I just replicated what was there on the prototype. And since I replicated that, I know it worked for them. I'm sure it worked for me. But so after getting these contours, getting some texture. Uh, down on the on everything, getting some color down on everything. Um, you know, there's a few things upcoming now, so it's now it's time. Uh, I've already started since all these videos. I've already started uh, very seriously committed to getting track and wiring the modules. Uh, I do that in a bit of a funny order as well too. So I'm already I've already started on wiring, uh, but I've already got part of the track laid too. So I'm kind of wiring and tra laying track uh, simultaneously, uh, and I'm pretty far along on those projects at this point on this module. But now I've got all the basic contours in place, so it's time for static grass. I've already got a lot of trees planted, but at this point, the only thing left to do is kind of the finishing products. That's planting trees, static grass, in my case, leg track and wiring come afterwards. The lighting is already integrated into the module, so a little bit of final shaping on the back before I get the final textures and airbrush on there. And I've come real far on these modules, and they're very nearly done. And you'll see them next month. You'll see us for our live show next month where we 